Start hour 11. Page 331. In February 2019, FNS issued a modest regulatory change that applied only to able-bodied individuals without dependents, beneficiaries aged 18 to 49, not elderly or disabled, who did not have children or other dependents in the home, ABOD. The FNS rule changed when a state could receive a waiver from implementing the ABOD work requirement. Under the new rule, in order to waive the work requirement, the state's unemployment rate had to be above 6% for more than 24 months. The rule also defined area in such a way that states would be unable to combine non-contiguous counties in order to maximize their waivers. Of the more than 40 million food stamp beneficiaries, the Trump rule would have applied only to 688,000 individuals in fiscal year 2021. The Trump reform was scheduled to go into effect, but a D.C. District Court federal judge enjoined the rule. The USDA filed an appeal in late December 2020, 65, but the Biden administration withdrew from defending the challenge, and the rule was never implemented. Beyond the able-bodied work requirement, FNS should implement better regulation to clarify options for states to implement the general work requirement. This requirement is an option states can apply to work-capable beneficiaries aged 16 to 59. If beneficiaries' work hours are below 30 hours a week, states can implement the general work requirements to oblige beneficiaries to register for work or participate in SNAP employment and training or work fair assigned by the state SNAP agency. Increased clarity for states would include items like states being required to offer employment and training spots for those that request them, not simply budgeting for every currently enrolled able-bodied adult. Reform broad-based categorical eligibility. Federal law permits states to enroll individuals in food stamps if they receive a benefit from another program, such as the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TNF, program. However, under an administrative option in TNF called Broad-Based Categorical Eligibility, BBC, benefit is defined so broadly that it includes simply receiving distributed pamphlets and 1 to 800 numbers. LY the asset requirement, how much the applicant has in resources, such as bank accounts or property. Adopting the BBC option has even allowed millionaires to enroll in the food stamp program. The Trump administration proposed to close the loophole with a rule to increase program integrity and reduce fraud, waste, and abuse. The regulation was not finalized before the end of the Trump administration. Reevaluate the thrifty food plan. In a dramatic overreach, the Biden administration unilaterally increased food stamp benefits by at least 23% in October 2021. Through an update to the thrifty food plan, in which the USDA analyzes a basket of foods intended to provide a nutritious diet, the USDA increased food stamp outlays by between $250 billion and $300 billion over 10 years. Although the 2018 Farm Bill instructed FNS to update the Thrifty Food Plan by 2023 and every five years thereafter, every previous Thrifty Food Plan has been always cost-neutral, just an inflation update. Exactly what CBO estimated as cost of the 2018 Farm Bill. The Biden administration may have skirted regulations and congressional authority to increase the overall cost of the program. In fact, Senate and House Republicans requested that the Government Accountability Office investigate the legal authorities and process that the USDA undertook to arrive at such an unprecedented increase. Eliminate the heat and eat loophole. States can artificially boost a household's food stamp benefit by using the heat and eat loophole. The amount of food stamps a household receives is based on its countable income, income minus certain deductions. Households that receive benefits from the Low Income Heat and Energy Assistance Program, LIHEAP, are eligible for a larger utility deduction. In order to make households eligible for the higher deduction, and thus for greater food stamp benefits, states have distributed LIHEAP checks for amounts as small as $1 to food stamp recipients. Under the Trump administration, the USDA proposed a rule, which was not finalized, that would have standardized the utility allowance. Reform WIC. Turning to WIC, this program distributes money through EBT cards to help low-income women, infants, and children under six purchase nutrition-rich foods and nutrition education, including breastfeeding support. As of August 2022, approximately 6.3 million people participated in WIC each month to purchase food. In 2021, WIC federal outlays were $5 billion. The next administration should reform the state voucher system. State agencies control WIC costs by approving only one brand of infant formula through competitive bidding for infant formula rebate contracts. Because 50% of baby formula is purchased through the federal WIC program, it is vital that regulation for these competitive bidding contracts does not unintentionally create monopolies. Reevaluate excessive regulation. As for baby formula regulations generally, labeling regulations and regulations that unnecessarily delay the manufacture and sale of baby formula should be reevaluated. During the Biden administration, there have been devastating baby formula shortages. Return to the original purpose of school meals. Federal meal programs for K-12 students were created to provide food to children from low-income families while at school. 
Today, however, federal school meals increasingly resemble entitlement programs that have strayed far from their original objective and represent an example of the ever-expanding federal footprint in local school operations. The NSLP and SBP are the two largest K-12 meal programs provided by federal taxpayer money. The NSLP launched in 1946 and the SBP in 1966, both as options specifically for children in poverty. During the COVID-19 pandemic, federal policymakers temporarily expanded access to school meal programs, but some lawmakers and federal officials have now proposed making this expansion permanent. Options specifically for children in poverty. During the COVID-19 pandemic, federal policymakers temporarily expanded access to school meal programs, but some lawmakers and federal officials have now proposed making this expansion permanent. Yet even before the pandemic, research found that federal officials had already expanded these programs to serve children from upper-income homes, and these programs are rife with improper payments and inefficiencies. Heritage Foundation research from 2019 found that after the enactment of the Community Eligibility Provision, CP, in 2010, the share of students from middle and upper-income homes receiving free meals in states that participated in CP doubled, and in some cases tripled, all in a program meant for children from families with incomes at or below 185% of the federal poverty line. Children from homes at or below 130% of the federal poverty line are eligible for free lunches, while students from families at or below 185% of poverty are eligible for reduced price lunches. Under CP, if 40% of students in a school or school district are eligible for federal meals, all students in that school or district can receive free meals. However, the USDA has taken it even further, improperly interpreting the Law 85 to allow a subset of schools within a district to be grouped together to reach the 40% threshold. As a result, a school with zero low-income students could be grouped together with schools with high levels of low-income students, and as a result, all the students in the schools within that group, even schools without a single low-income student, can receive free federal meals. Schools can direct resources meant for students in poverty to children from wealthier families. Furthermore, the NSLP and SBP are among the most inaccurate federal programs according to Payment Accuracy, Gov, a project of the U.S. Office of Management and Budget and the Office of the Inspector General. D. The rigor of annual reporting requirements in 2018, the NSLP had wasted nearly $2 billion in taxpayer resources through payments provided to ineligible recipients. Even after the auditing changes, which the U.S. Government Accountability Office said results in the USDA not regularly assess, ING, the program's fraud risks, the NSLP wasted nearly $500 million in FI 2021. The SVP now wastes nearly $200 million annually. Despite the ongoing effort to expand school meals under CEP and the evidence of waste and inefficiency, left-of-center members of Congress and President Biden's administration have nonetheless proposed further expansions to extend federal school meals to include every K, 12 student, regardless of need. The administration recently proposed expanding federal school meal programs offered during the school year to be offered during the summer as part of the American Families Plan and also proposed expanding CP. Other federal officials, including Senator Bernie Sanders, Independent Vermont, have, in recent years, proposed expanding the NSLP to all students. To serve students in need and prevent the misuse of taxpayer money, the next administration should focus on students in need and reject efforts to transform federal school meals into an entitlement program. Specifically, the next administration should promulgate a rule properly interpreting CP. The USDA should issue a rule that clarifies that only an individual school or a school district as a whole, not a subset of schools within a district, must meet the 40% criteria to be eligible for CP. Education officials should be prohibited from grouping schools together. Work with lawmakers to eliminate CP. The NSLP and SBP should be directed to serve children in need, not become an entitlement for students from middle and upper income homes. Congress should eliminate CP. Further, the USDA should not provide meals to students during the summer unless students are taking summer school classes. T. Efforts to create universal free school meals. The USDA should work with lawmakers to restore NSLP and SBP to their original goal of providing food to K-12 students who otherwise would not have food to eat while at school. Federal school meals should be focused on children in need, and any efforts to expand student eligibility for federal school meals to include all K-12 students should be soundly rejected. Such expansion would allow an inefficient, wasteful program to grow, magnifying the amount of wasted taxpayer resources. Reform conservation programs. Farmers, in general, are excellent stewards of the land, if not for moral or ethical considerations, then out of self-interest to make sure their land and, by extension, their livelihoods remain intact. Farmers are often called the original conservationists. When evaluating federal conservation programs, it is important to remember the importance of the land to farmers. 
In terms of USDA federal conservation programs, both the USDA's Farm Service Agency, FSA, and Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, oversee numerous programs. As a general matter, the next administration should ensure that these programs address genuine and specific environmental concerns with a focus on currently existing environmental problems, not those that are speculative in nature. These conservation programs should have clearly identifiable goals, with the success or failure of these programs being directly measurable. Any assistance to farmers to take specific actions should not be provided unless the assistance will directly and clearly help to address a specific environmental problem. Further, any assistance to encourage farmers to engage in certain practices should only be provided if farmers would not have adopted the practices in the first place. There are specific issues that the next administration should address. The Conservation Reserve Program, 96, which is run by FSA, pays farmers to not farm some of their land. This program has recently received attention, as agricultural groups rightfully seek to farm without penalty voluntarily idled land, in light of the consequences to food prices of Russia invading Ukraine. There is also a need to reform USDA's conservation easements. These easements are a powerful tool to incentivize long-term preservation of ecosystems while still allowing farmers to benefit economically. However, when farmers and ranchers sign conservation easements with the USDA, they can be enforced in perpetuity. Future generations, be they the descendants of the landowner or new residents, are bound by those conditions. Ecosystems and topography naturally change over time, but without legislative change, easement requirements will not. The next administration should champion the elimination of the Conservation Reserve Program. Farmers should not be paid in such a sweeping way not to farm their land. If there is a desire to ensure that extremely sensitive land is not farmed, this should be addressed through targeted efforts that are clearly connected to addressing a specific and concrete environmental harm. The USDA should work with Congress to eliminate this overbroad program. Reform NRCS wetlands and erodible land compliance and appeals. Problematic NRCS overreach could be avoided entirely by removing its authority to prescribe specific practices on a particular farm operation in order to ensure continued eligibility to participate in USDA farm programs and to require instead that each farm, as a function of eligibility, must have created a general best practices plan. Such a plan could be approved by the Local County Soil and Water Conservation District, SWCD. The local SWCD commissioners are elected by their peers in each respective county and are better suited than the NRCS to provide guidance for farm operations in their respective jurisdictions. At a minimum, a new administration should support legislation to divest more power to the states and possibly local SWCDs regarding erodible land and wetlands conservation. Reform easements. The new administration should, to the extent authorized by law, limit the use of permanent easements and collaborate with lawmakers to prohibit the USDA from creating new permanent easements. Other major issues and specific recommendations. Although the following issues have not been listed as priority, these issues are still extremely important, and the next administration should address them. Only meat and poultry from federally inspected facilities can be sold in interstate commerce. Even meat and poultry from USDA-approved state inspected facilities may only be sold in interstate commerce, with limited exceptions. This is despite the fact that states with USDA-approved inspection programs must meet and enforce requirements that are at least equal to those imposed under the Federal Meat and Poultry Products Inspection Acts and the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act of 1978. This is an unnecessary regulatory barrier that makes it difficult to get meat and poultry into interstate commerce to create more options for consumers and farmers. Legislation entitled the New Markets for State Inspected Meat and Poultry Act of 2021 would help to remove this obstacle. The next administration should promote legislation that would allow state inspected meat to be sold in interstate commerce. These barriers to the sale of meat and poultry from USDA-approved state inspected facilities should be removed. Eliminate or reform marketing orders and checkoff programs. Marketing orders and checkoff programs for agricultural commodities are similar in many ways. They both allow private actors within an industry to collaborate with the federal government to compel other competitors within an industry to fund the respective marketing order or checkoff program. There are currently 22 checkoff programs, 104, and they focus on research and promotion of commodities such as beef and eggs. Marketing orders cover research and promotion, but also cover issues such as quality regulations and volume controls. The latter issue, volume controls, is a means to restrict supply, which drives up prices for consumers. Fortunately, there are few active volume controls. Marketing orders and checkoff programs are some of the most egregious programs run by the USDA. They are, in effect, a tax, a means to compel speech and government-blessed cartels. Instead of getting private cooperation, they are tools for industry actors to work with government to force cooperation. The next administration should reduce the number and scope of marketing orders and checkoff programs. The USDA should reject any new requests for marketing orders and checkoff programs to the extent authorized by law and eliminate existing programs when possible. While the programs work differently, there are often petition processes and other ways that make it difficult for affected parties to get rid of the marketing orders and checkoff programs. 106 and the USDA itself may not even be required to honor requests to terminate a program. The USDA should make the process easier. 
Further, the USDA should reject any effort to bring back volume controls to limit supplies of commodities. Work with Congress to eliminate marketing orders and checkoff programs. These programs should be eliminated, and if industry actors want to collaborate, they should do so through private means, not using the government to compel cooperation. Promote legislation that would require regular votes. There should be regular voting for parties subject to checkoff programs and marketing orders. For example, the voting should occur at least every five years to determine whether a marketing order or checkoff program should continue. The USDA should be required to honor the results of such a vote. Through regular voting, parties can demonstrate their support for a marketing order or checkoff program and ensure that those administering them will be held accountable. Focus on trade policy, not trade promotion. The USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service, FAS, covers numerous issues, including trade policy, which is a reference to removing trade barriers, among other things, to ensure an environment conducive to trade. It also covers trade promotion. This includes programs like the Market Access Program 110 that subsidizes trade associations, businesses, and other private entities to market and promote their products overseas. FAS should play a proactive and leading role to help open up markets for American farmers and ranchers. There are numerous barriers, such as sanitary and phytosanitary measures, blocking American agricultural products from gaining access to foreign markets. However, FAS should not help businesses and industries promote their exports, something these businesses and industries can and should do on their own. The next administration should push legislation to repeal export promotion programs. The USDA should work with Congress to repeal market development programs like the Market Access Program and similar programs. Remove obstacles for agricultural biotechnology. Innovation is critical to agricultural production and the ability to meet future food needs. The next administration should embrace innovation and technology, not hinder its use, especially because of scare tactics that ignore sound science. One of the key innovations in agriculture is genetic engineering. According to the USDA, see, currently, over 90% of U.S. corn, upland cotton, and soybeans are produced using G, genetically engineered, varieties. Despite the importance of agricultural biotechnology, in 2016, Congress passed a federal mandate to label genetically engineered food. This legislation was arguably just a means to try to provide a negative connotation to GE food. There are other challenges as well for agricultural biotechnology. For example, Mexico plans to ban the importation of U.S. genetically modified yellow corn. The next administration should counter scare tactics and remove obstacles. The USDA should strongly counter scare tactics regarding agricultural biotechnology and adopt policies to remove unnecessary barriers to approvals and the adoption of biotechnology. Repeal the federal labeling mandate. The USDA should work with Congress to repeal the federal labeling law while maintaining federal preemption and stress that voluntary labeling is allowed. Use all tools available to remove improper trade barriers against agricultural biotechnology. The USDA should work closely with the Office of the United States Trade Representative to remove improper barriers imposed by other countries to block U.S. agricultural goods. Reform Forest Service Wildfire Management The United States Forest Service is one of four federal government land management agencies that administer 606 million acres, or 95% of the 640 million acres of surface land area managed by the federal government. Located within the USDA, the Forest Service manages the National Forest System, which is comprised of 193 million acres. As explained by the USDA, the USDA Forest Service's mission is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. The Forest Service should focus on proactive management of the forests and grasslands that does not depend heavily on burning. There should be resilient forests and grasslands in the wake of management actions. Wildfires have become a primary vegetation management regime for national forests and grasslands. Recognizing the need for vegetation management, the Forest Service has adopted pyrosilviculture using unplanned fire, 119 such as unplanned human-caused fires, to otherwise accomplish vegetation management. The Forest Service should instead be focusing on addressing the precipitous annual amassing of biomass in the national forests that drive the behavior of wildfires. By thinning trees, removing live fuels and deadwood, and taking other preventive steps, the Forest Service can help to minimize the consequences of wildfires. Increasing timber sales could also play an important role in the effort to change the behavior of wildfire because there would be less biomass. Timber sales and timber harvested in public forests dropped precipitously in the early 1990s and still remain very low. For example, in 1988, the volume of timber sold and harvested by volume was about 11 billion and 12.6 billion board feet, BBF, respectively. In 2021, timber sold was 2.8 BBF and timber harvested was 2.4 BBF. In 2018, President Donald Trump issued Executive Order 138552, among other things, promote active management of forests and reduce wildfire risks. The executive order stated, active management of vegetation is needed to treat these dangerous conditions on federal lands, but is often delayed due to challenges associated with regulatory analysis and current consultation requirements. It further explained the need to reduce regulatory obstacles to fuel reduction in forests created by the National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act. 
the next administration should champion executive action consistent with law and proactive legislation to reduce wildfires. This would involve embracing Executive Order 13855, building upon it, and working with lawmakers to promote active management of vegetation, reduce regulatory obstacles to reducing fuel buildup, and increase timber sales. Eliminate or reform the dietary guidelines. The USDA, in collaboration with HHS, publishes the dietary guidelines every five years. For more than 40 years, the federal government has been releasing dietary guidelines, 126, and during this time, there has been constant controversy due to questionable recommendations and claims regarding the politicization of the process. In the 2015 Dietary Guidelines process, the Influential Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee veered off mission and attempted to persuade the USDA and HHS to adopt nutritional advice that focused not just on human health, but the health of the planet. Issues such as climate change and sustainability infiltrated the process. Fortunately, the 2020 process did not get diverted in this manner. However, the dietary guidelines remain a potential tool to influence dietary choices to achieve objectives unrelated to the nutritional and dietary well-being of Americans. There is no shortage of private sector dietary advice for the public and nutrition and dietary choices are best left to individuals to address their personal needs. This includes working with their own health professionals. As it is, there is constantly changing advice provided by the government, with insufficient qualifications on the advice, oversimplification to the point of miscommunicating important points, questionable use of science, and potential political influence. The dietary guidelines have a major impact because they not only can influence how private health providers offer nutritional advice, but they also inform federal programs. School meals are required to be consistent with the guidelines. The next administration should work with lawmakers to repeal the dietary guidelines. The USDA should help lead an effort to repeal the dietary guidelines. Minimally, the next administration should reform the dietary guidelines. The USDA, with HHS, should develop a more transparent process that properly considers the underlying science and does not overstate its findings. It should also ensure that the dietary guidelines focus on nutritional issues and do not veer off mission by focusing on unrelated issues, such as the environment, that have nothing to do with nutritional advice. In fact, if environmental concerns supersede or water down recommendations for human nutritional advice, the public would be receiving misleading health information. The USDA, working with lawmakers, should codify these reforms into law. Organizational Issues Based on the recommended reforms identified as ideal solutions, the USDA would look different in many respects. One of the biggest changes would be a USDA that is not focused on welfare, given that means tested welfare programs would be moved to HHS. The Food and Nutrition Service that administers the food and nutrition programs would be eliminated. The Farm Service Agency, which administers many of the farm subsidy programs, would be significantly smaller in size if the ideal farm subsidy reforms were adopted. Most important, a conservative USDA, as envisioned, would not be used as a governmental tool to transform the nation's food system but instead would respect the importance of efficient agricultural production and ensure that the government does not hinder farmers and ranchers from producing an abundant supply of safe and affordable food. For a conservative USDA to become a reality, and for it to stay on course with the mission as outlined, the White House must strongly support these reforms and install strong USDA leaders. These individuals almost certainly will be faced with opposition from some in the agricultural community who would fight changing subsidies in any fashion, although many of the reforms would likely be embraced by those in agriculture. There would be strong opposition from environmental groups and others who want the federal government to transform American agriculture to meet their ideological objectives. Finally, there would be opposition from left-of-center groups who do not want to reform SNAP and would expand welfare and dependency, such as through universal free school meals, as opposed to reducing dependency. Reducing the scope of government and promoting individual freedom may not always be easy, but it is something that conservatives regularly should strive for. The listed reforms to the U.S. Department of Agriculture would help to accomplish these objectives and are well worth fighting for to achieve a freer and more prosperous nation. Conclusion This chapter started with a discussion of the incredible success of American farmers and American agriculture in general. This is how the chapter should close as well. Americans are blessed with an agricultural sector and a food system in general, which are worthy of incredible respect. A conservative USDA should appreciate this while recognizing that its role is to serve the interests of all Americans, not special interests. By being a champion of unleashing the potential of American agriculture, a conservative USDA would help to ensure a future with an abundant supply of safe and affordable food for individuals and families in the United States and across the globe. Department of Education Mission Federal education policy should be limited and, ultimately, the Federal Department of Education should be eliminated. When power is exercised, it should empower students and families, not government. In our pluralistic society, families and students should be free to choose from a diverse set of school options and learning environments that best fit their needs. 
Our post-secondary institutions should also reflect such diversity, with room for not only traditional, liberal arts colleges and research universities, but also faith-based institutions, career schools, military academies, and lifelong learning programs. Elementary and secondary education policy should follow the path outlined by Milton Friedman in 1955, wherein education is publicly funded, but education decisions are made by families. Ultimately, every parent should have the option to direct his or her child's share of education funding through an education savings account, ESA, funded overwhelmingly by state and local taxpayers, which would empower parents to choose a set of education options that meet their child's unique needs. States are eager to lead in K-12 education. For decades, they have acted independently of the federal government to pioneer a variety of constructive reforms and school choice programs. For example, in 2011, Arizona first piloted ESAs, which provide families roughly 90% of what the state would have spent on that child in public school to be used instead on education options such as private school tuition, online courses, and tutoring. In 2022, Arizona expanded the program to be available to all families. The future of education freedom and reform in the states is bright and will shine brighter when regulations and red tape from Washington are eliminated. Federal money is inevitably accompanied by rules and regulations that keep the influx of funds from having much, if any, impact on student outcomes. It raises the cost of education without raising student achievement. Our use to fund education programs, those funds should be block granted to states without strings, eliminating the need for many federal and state bureaucrats. Eventually, policymaking and funding should take place at the state and local level, closest to the affected families. Although student loans and grants should ultimately be restored to the private sector, or, at the very least, the federal government should revisit its role as a guarantor, rather than direct lender. Federal post-secondary education investments should bolster economic growth, and recipient institutions should nourish academic freedom and embrace intellectual diversity. That has not, however, been the track record of federal higher education policy or of the many institutions of higher education that are hostile to free expression, open academic inquiry, and American exceptionalism. Federal post-secondary policy should be more than massive, inefficient, and open-ended subsidies to traditional colleges and universities. It should be rebalanced to focus far more on bolstering the workforce skills of Americans who have no interest in pursuing a four-year academic degree. It should reflect a fuller picture of learning after high school, placing apprenticeship programs of all types and career and technical education on an even playing field with degrees from colleges and universities. Rather than continuing to buttress a higher education establishment captured by woke, diversocrats, and a de facto monopoly enforced by the federal accreditation cartel, federal post-secondary education policy should prepare students for jobs in the dynamic economy, nurture institutional diversity, and expose schools to greater market forces. Point one overview for most of our history. The federal government played a minor role in education. Then, over a 14-month period beginning in 1964, Congress planted the seeds for what would become the U.S. Department of Education, ED or the Department. In July of that year, President Lyndon B. Igned into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964, after Congress reached a consensus that the mistreatment of Black Americans was no longer tolerable and merited a federal response. In the case of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, ECA, 2, and the Higher Education Act of 1965, HEA, 3, Congress sought to improve educational outcomes for disadvantaged students by providing additional compensatory funding for low-income children and lower-income college students. Spending on ECA and the HEA, part of Johnson's War on Poverty, grew exponentially in the years that followed. By fiscal year 2022, ESCA programs received $27.7 billion in appropriations, in addition to $190 billion that came through the pandemic's elementary and secondary schools emergency relief, ESSER, funds, for which relied on ESCA formulas. The same year, the department spent more than $2 billion just to administer Title IV of the HEA, which authorizes federal student loans and Pell Grants. It provided $22.5 billion in Pell Grants, and it oversaw outlays of close to $100 billion in direct student loans. Since 1965, Congress has continued to layer on dozens of new laws and programs as federal solutions to myriad education problems. In 1973, it passed the Rehabilitation Act, 5, and, in 1975, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, 6, to address educational neglect of students with disabilities. In 2002, it created the Institute for Education Sciences to consolidate education data collection and fund research. Congress has also enacted a series of Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Acts, including Perkins v. in 2018.7 Congress could have, and once did, distribute management of federal education programs outside of a single department. But for those interested in expanding federal funding and influence in education, this unconsolidated approach was less than ideal, because a single, captive agency would allow them to promote their agenda more effectively across administrations. 
successfully lobbied for and delivered the cabinet-level agency. When it was established in 1979, becoming operational in 1980, the agency was supposed to act as a corralling mechanism. Carter signed the Department of Education Organization Act 8 into law in 1979, believing in part that it would reduce administrative costs and improve efficiency by housing most of the federal education programs that had proliferated in the wake of Johnson's war on poverty under one roof. It has had the opposite effect. Instead, special interest groups like the National Education Association, NEA, American Federation of Teachers, AFT, and the higher education lobby have leveraged the agency to continuously expand federal expenditures, a desirable funding stream from their vantage point because federal budgets are not constrained like state and local budgets that must be balanced each year. By FI 2022, the department's discretionary and mandatory appropriation topped $80 billion, not including student loan outlays. Each of its programs has attendant federal strings and red tape. One recent example is the Biden administration's requirement that state education agencies and school districts submit equity plans as a condition of receiving COVID recovery ESSER funds in the American Rescue Plan, ARP. This exercise led to the hiring of numerous new government employees as the rules were promulgated, plans were created after collecting public feedback, and those plans were eventually deemed satisfactory. The next administration will need a plan to redistribute the various congressionally approved federal education programs across the government, eliminate those that are ineffective or duplicative, and then eliminate the unproductive red tape and rules by entrusting states and districts with flexible, formula-driven block grants. This chapter details that plan. As the next administration executes its work, it should be guided by a few core principles, including advancing education freedom. Ability of existing federal education spending to fund families directly or allowing federal tax credits to encourage voluntary contributions to K-12 education savings accounts managed by charitable nonprofits could significantly advance education choice. Providing education choice for federal children. Congress has a special responsibility to children who are connected to military families who live in the District of Columbia or who are members of sovereign tribes. Responsibility for serving these students should be housed in agencies that are already serving these families. Restoring state and local control over education funding. As Washington begins to downsize its intervention in education, existing funding should be sent to states as grants over which they have full control, enabling states to put federal funding toward any lawful education purpose under state law. Treating taxpayers like investors in federal student aid. Taxpayers should expect their investments in higher education to generate economic productivity. When the federal government lends money to individuals for a post-secondary education, taxpayers should expect those borrowers to repay protecting the federal student loan portfolio from predatory politicians. The new administration must end the practice of acting like the federal student loan portfolio is a campaign fund to curry political support and votes. The new administration must end abuses in the loan forgiveness programs. Borrowers should be expected to repay their loans. Safeguarding civil rights. Enforcement of civil rights should be based on a proper understanding of those laws, rejecting gender ideology and critical race theory. Stopping executive overreach. Congress should set policy, not presidents through pen and phone executive orders, and not agencies through regulations and guidance. National emergency declarations should expire absent express congressional authorization within 60 days after the date of the declaration. Bolstered by an ever-growing cabal of special interests that thrive off federal largesse, the infrastructure that supports America's costly federal intervention in education from early childhood through graduate school has entrenched itself. But unlike the public sector bureaucracies, public employee unions, and the higher education lobby, families and students do not need a Department of Education to learn, grow, and improve their lives. It is critical that the next administration tackle this entrenched infrastructure. Needed reforms. Federal intervention in education has failed to promote student achievement. After trillions spent since 1965 on the collective programs now housed within the walls of the department, student academic outcomes remain stagnant. On the main National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP, reading outcomes on the 2022 administration have remained unchanged over the past 30 years. Declines in math performance are even more concerning than students' lack of progress on reading outcomes. Fourth and eighth grade math scores saw the largest decline since the assessments were first administered in 1990. Average 4th grade math scores declined 5 points, and average 8th grade math scores declined 8 points. Just one-third of 8th graders nationally are proficient in reading and math. Just 27% of 8th graders were proficient in math in 2022, and just 31% of 8th graders scored proficient in reading in 2022. The NEP Long-Term Trend Assessment shows academic stagnation since the 1970s, with particular stagnation in the reading scores of 13-year-old students since 1971, when the assessment was first administered. Math scores, though modestly improved, are still lackluster. Additionally, the department has created a shadow Department of Education operating in states across the country. 
Federal mandates, programs, and proclamations have spurred a hiring spree among state education agencies, with more than 48,000 employees currently on staff in state agencies across the country. Those employees are more than 10 times the number of employees, 4,400, 10 at the Federal Department of Education, and their jobs largely entail reporting back to Washington. Research conducted by the Heritage Foundation's Jonathan Butcher finds that the federal government funds 41% of the salary costs of state education agencies. This bloat has persisted for decades. In 1998, a commission led by Representative Pete Hoekstra released a critical report based on extensive fieldwork, interviews, and analysis of the Department of Education. The report, Education at a Crossroads, What Works and What's Wasted in Education Today, detailed the suffocating bureaucratic red tape Carter's agency had wrapped around states. The commission estimated that states completed nearly 50 million hours of paperwork just to get their federal education spending, which at that time, they estimated, resulted in just 65 cents to 70 cents of each federal taxpayer dollar making its way to the classroom. The situation has only worsened since the Hoekstra report. More recent evidence of Washington's bureaucratic paperwork burden can be found in the growing number of non-teaching staff in public schools across the country, which doubled relative to growth in student enrollment from 1992 to 2015. The labyrinthian nature of federal education programs, convoluted funding formulas, competitive grant applications, reporting requirements, etc., has likely contributed to the considerable bureaucratic bloat in state and local school districts across the country and is one of the key areas of needed reform. Streamlining existing programs and funding so that dollars are sent to states through straightforward per-pupil allocations or in the form of grants that states can put toward any lawful education purpose under state law would bring a needed easing of the federal compliance burden. The federal government should confine its involvement in education policy to that of a statistics-gathering agency that disseminates information to the states. To improve educational opportunities for all Americans, the next administration should work with Congress to pass a Department of Education Reorganization Act to reform, eliminate, or move the department's programs and offices to appropriate agencies. The following is an overview of what should happen within each of the offices and to each of the programs currently operated by the department. Program and Office Prioritization Within the Department Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, OEC. The OSC is comprised of 36 programs, ranging from Title I, Part A, of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and Impact Aid, to programs for Native American students and the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. Reduce the number of programs managed by OEC and transfer some remaining programs to other federal agencies. Transfer Title I, Part A, which provides federal funding for lower-income school districts, to the Department of Health and Human Services, specifically the Administration for Children and Families. It should be administered as a no-strings-attached formula block grant. Restore revenue responsibility for Title I funding to the states over a 10-year period. OSC also currently manages the Federal Impact Aid Program, which provides funding to school districts to compensate for reductions in property tax revenue due to the presence of federal property, such as that associated with a military base or tribal lands. Eliminate impact aid not tied to students. Move student-driven impact aid programs to the Department of Defense Education Authority, DUDA, or the Department of Interior's Bureau of Indian Education. Transfer all Indian education programs to the Bureau of Indian Education, the DC. Opportunity Scholarship Program, which provides vouchers to low-income children living in the nation's capital, appropriate as DC is under the jurisdiction of Congress, should be expanded into a universal program, formula-funded, and moved to the Department of Health and Human Services. All other programs at OEC should be block-granted or eliminated. Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education. Transfer the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education's few programs to the Department of Labor, but move the tribally controlled post-secondary career and technical education program to the Bureau of Indian Education. NT of Health and Human Services. All other programs at OEC should be block-granted or eliminated. Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education. Transfer the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education's few programs to the Department of Labor, but move the tribally controlled post-secondary career and technical education program to the Bureau of Indian Education. Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, OSERS. The Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, OSERS, houses nearly two dozen programs, ranging from funding for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, and the National Technical Institute for the Deaf to Special Olympics funding and the American Printing House for the Blind. Most IDEA funding should be converted into a no-strings formula block grant targeted at students with disabilities and distributed directly to local education agencies by Health and Human Services Administration for Community Living. Transfer the Vocational Rehabilitation Grants for Native American Students to the Bureau of Indian Education. Phase out earmarks for a variety of special institutions, as originally envisioned. 
To the extent that Ozer supports federal efforts to enforce our laws against discrimination of individuals with disabilities, those assets should be moved to the Department of Justice, DOJ, along with the Office for Civil Rights, OCR. VED to the National Science Foundation If Congress decides to maintain IS as an independent agency, it needs to address major governance and management issues that keep it from being a productive contributor to the knowledge base related to teaching and learning. Office of Federal Student Aid, FSA the next administration should completely reverse the student loan federalization of 2010 and work with Congress to spin off FSA and its student loan obligations to a new government corporation with professional governance and management. With a statutory charge that it preserve the federal student loan portfolio for the benefit of the taxpayers and students, this new entity would be 1. Professionally governed by an agency head and board of trustees appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. 2. Funded with annual appropriations from Congress. And 3. Operated by professional managers. Federal loans would be assigned directly to the Treasury Department, which would manage collections and defaults. The new Federal Student Loan Authority would manage the loan portfolio, handle borrower relations, administer loan applications and disbursements, monitor institutional participation and accountability issues, and issue regulations. Office for Civil Rights, OCR, OCR should move to the Department of Justice. The federal government has an essential responsibility to enforce civil rights protections, but Washington should do so through the Department of Justice and federal courts. The OCR at DOJ should be able to enforce only through litigation. Toward General, Office of Finance and Operations, Office of the Chief Information Officer, Office of Communications and Outreach, and Office of Legislative and Congressional Affairs. The opportunity to join other agencies based on their expertise and the needs of other agencies should be made available. For example, OGC higher education lawyers would join the newly independent Federal Student Aid Office or the Department of Labor, and OGC civil rights attorneys would join DOJ. These positions must first be determined to serve a continued mission need prior to being transferred. Attorneys, accountants, experts, and specialists in the department's remaining offices subject to closure and whose positions are indispensable to serving the mission should have the opportunity to join other agencies. Current laws relating to the Department of Education that require repeal in order to fully wind down the Department of Education, Congress must pass, and the President must sign into law a Department of Education Reorganization Act, or Liquidating Authority Act, to direct the executive branch on how to devolve the agency as a standalone cabinet-level department. Congress should pass, and the next President should sign a Department of Education Reorganization Act. Current regulations promulgated by or relevant to the agency that should be rolled back or eliminated while the next administration works to distribute department programs across the federal government. It will need to thoroughly review the many education-related regulations promulgated by the Biden administration. There are five primary regulatory targets, as of December 2022, that require the next administration's attention. Regulations on 1. Charter school grant program priorities 2. Civil rights data collection 3. Student Assistance General Provisions, Federal Perkins Loan Program, and William D. Review regulatory changes to the School Meals Program under the Department of Agriculture and changes to the Income-Driven Student Loan Program. Additional Biden administration regulations on 1. Gainful employment, administrative capability, and financial responsibility for institutions that participate in the federal student loans and grant programs. 2. Title VI. 3. Accreditation of post-secondary institutions, and 4. Female athletics are expected and to be released in 2023. Thoroughly review the many education-related regulations promulgated by the Biden administration, as well as the school meals program and the income-driven student loan program. Charter School Grant Programs Congress first authorized the Charter School Program, CSP, in 1994, Title X, Part C of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, ECA, as amended, 20 U.S.C. Section 8061 ETC. 1994, it most recently reauthorized the program in 2015 as part of the Every Student Succeeds Act. On March 14, 2022, the department published a notice concerning proposed priorities, requirements, definitions, and grant selection criteria relating to the award of federal grants to applicants in CSP. This proposal increases the federal footprint in the charter school sector by ignoring statute and adding to the list of requirements imposed on charter schools. The new administration must take immediate steps to rescind the new requirements and lessen the federal restrictions on charter schools. Election that indicates the number of 1. High school, level interscholastic athletic sports in which only male and female students participate. 2. High school, level athletics teams in which only male or female students participate. And 3. Participants on high school, level interscholastic athletic sports teams in which only male or only female students participate. These poorly conceived changes are contrary to law, fail to take account of student privacy interests and statutory protections favoring parental rights under the Protection of Pupils' Rights Amendment. 
and jettison long-standing data collections that assist in the enforcement of Title IX. The new administration must quickly move to rescind these changes, which add a new, non-binary, sex category to OCR's data collection and issue a new CRDC that will collect data directly relevant to OCR's statutory enforcement authority, student assistance general provisions, Federal Perkins Loan Program, and William D. Ford Federal Direct Loan Program Final Regulations Effective July 1, 2023, the department promulgated final regulations addressing loan forgiveness under the HEA's provisions for borrower defense to repayment, BDR, closed school loan discharge, CSLD, and public service loan forgiveness, PSLF. The regulations also included prohibitions against pre-dispute arbitration agreements and class action waivers for students enrolling in institutions participating in Title IV student loan programs. Basis of Sex in Education Programs or Activities Receiving Federal Financial Assistance, Title IX, with its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking published on July 12, 2022. The Biden Education Department seeks to gut the hard-earned rights of women with its changes to the department's regulations implementing Title IX, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in educational programs and activities. Instead, the Biden administration has sought to trample women's and girls' athletic opportunities and due process on campus, threaten free speech and religious liberty and erode parental rights in elementary and secondary education regarding sensitive issues of sex. The new administration should take the following steps. Work with Congress to use the earliest available legislative vehicle to prohibit the department from using any appropriations or from otherwise enforcing any final regulations under Title IX promulgated by the department during the prior administration. Commence a new agency rulemaking process to rescind the current administration's Title IX regulations. Restore the Title IX regulations promulgated by then-Secretary Betsy DeVos on May 19, 2020, and define sex under Title IX to mean only biological sex recognized at birth. Work with Congress to amend Title IX to include due process requirements, define sex under Title IX to mean only biological sex recognized at birth, and strengthen protections for faith-based educational institutions, programs, and activities. Lehood that children will seek hormone treatments, such as puberty blockers, which are experimental medical interventions. Research has not demonstrated positive effects and long-term outcomes of these treatments, and the unintended side effects are still not fully understood. The next administration should abandon this change redefining sex to mean sexual orientation and gender identity in Title IX immediately across all departments. On its first day in office, the next administration should signal its intent to enter the rulemaking process to restore the Trump administration's Title IX regulation with the additional insistence that sex is properly understood as a fixed biological fact. Official notice and comment should be posted immediately. At the same time, the political appointees in the Office for Civil Rights should begin a full review of all Title IX investigations that were conducted on the understanding that sex referred to gender identity and or sexual orientation. All ongoing investigations should be dropped, and all school districts affected should be given notice that they are free to drop any policy changes pursued under pressure from the Biden administration. The OCR Assistant Secretary should prepare a report of OCR's actions for the new Secretary of Education, who should, by speech or letter, publicize the nature of the overreach engaged in by his predecessor. The secretary should make it clear that FERPA allows parents full access to their children's educational records, so any practice of paperwork obfuscation on this front violates federal law. IL rights enforcement under Title VI for student discipline cases. Before the DCL, a school would be in violation of federal law for treating black and white students differently for the same offense, disparate treatment. Under the Obama administration, schools were at risk of losing federal funding if they treated black and white students equally but had aggregate differences in the rates of school discipline by race, disparate impact. OCR leveraged federal civil rights investigations as policy enforcement tools. These investigations could only end when school districts agreed to adopt lenient discipline policies, commonly known as restorative justice. Academic studies, as well as student and teacher surveys, suggest that academics and school climate have been harmed substantially by this push. The Trump administration rescinded the Obama administration's guidance on school discipline and corrected the Obama administration's overreach in Title VI enforcement. The next administration should continue the policy of the Trump administration in this area and direct the department to conduct a comprehensive review of all Title VI cases to ascertain to what extent these cases include allegations of disparate impact. OCR should also review all resolution agreements with school districts to conform with this policy. As part of this effort, the new administration should also direct the department and DOJ jointly to issue enforcement guidance stating that the agencies will no longer investigate Title VI cases that exclusively rest on allegations of disparate impact. 
to the extent that. In addition to rescinding the policy and any related guidance, the next secretary should work with the next attorney general on a regulation that would clarify current regulations to state that Title VI of the Civil Rights Act does not include a disparate impact standard. As law professor Gail Harriet has noted, the alleged existence of a disparate impact standard under Title VI makes everything presumed illegal unless given special dispensation by the federal government. Although it would require political capital from the White House, given that mainstream news outlets are sure to frame it as an attack on civil rights, the next conservative administration should take sweeping action to assure that the purpose of the Civil Rights Act is not inverted through a disparate impact standard to provide a pretext for theoretically endless federal meddling. Assistance to states for the education of children with disabilities, preschool grants for children with disabilities, equity and idea, effective January 18, 2017. The department issued final regulations under Part B of IDEA that require states to consider race and ethnicity in the identification, placement, and discipline of students with disabilities. The new administration should rescind this regulation. Students should never be denied access to special education services because of their race or ethnicity, but this is happening in school districts across the country thanks to the Obama administration's equity and IDEA regulation. This was not the intent of the regulation, but it is an inevitable byproduct of its flawed assumptions. ES that are intended to address the root causes of disproportionality. In practice, this can mean rating special education funding to pay for CRT-inspired, equity, consultants, and professional development. This is especially problematic given that both of the assumptions behind equity and idea are flawed. Special education services provide extra assistance to students. They do not harm them. And according to the most rigorous research on the subject, conducted by Penn State's Paul Morgan, black students are actually underrepresented in special education once adequate statistical controls are made. That means that this regulation effectively further depresses the provision of valuable services to an already underserved group. The next administration should immediately commence rulemaking to rescind the equity and idea regulation. No replacement regulation is required. The Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, OSERS, should prepare a digest of the best research on this subject and share it directly with state superintendents and state special education leaders across the country, who have been led by this regulation to believe a false problem diagnosis. Every effort should be made to dissuade states from continuing to operate on the assumption that overrepresentation requires state intervention after the federal pressure is rescinded. Provide school meals to children in need. Do not use federal meals to support radical ideology in May 2022, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA. Tried to advance a radical political agenda using the federal school meal program. Nearly a century ago, federal lawmakers adopted the National School Lunch Program, NSLP, and School Breakfast Program, SBP, and other services that provide meals for K-12 students to give children from low-income families access to food while at school. Since the 1940s, federal lawmakers have greatly expanded these meal programs, creating an entitlement for nearly all students, regardless of family income levels, and have turned the meal programs into some of the most wasteful federal programs in Washington. Now, the USDA is threatening to withhold federal taxpayer spending for these meals from schools that do not implement Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 so that the term sex is replaced with sexual orientation and gender identity, SOGI. The next administration should prohibit the USDA or any other federal agency from withholding services from federal or state agencies, including, but not limited to K, 12 schools that choose not to replace sex with SOGI in that agency's administration of Title IX. The administration will have significant support for this policy change among state officials and members of Congress. 22 state attorneys general filed a lawsuit after the USDA's announcement that the agency intended to withhold spending from schools that do not replace sex with SOGI. Members of Congress also introduced legislation in 2022 that would prohibit the agency from carrying out its intentions regarding Title IX. Phase out existing income-driven repayment plans, while income-driven repayment, IDR, of student loans is a superior approach relative to fixed payment plans, the number of IDR plans has proliferated beyond reason. And recent IDR plans are so generous that they require no or only token repayment from many students. The secretary should phase out all existing IDR plans by making new loans, including consolidation loans, ineligible and should implement a new IDR plan. The new plan should have an income exemption equal to the poverty line and require payments of 10% of income above the exemption. If new legislation is possible, there should be no loan forgiveness, but if not, existing law would require forgiving any remaining balance after 25 years. President Biden has proposed a new income-driven repayment program that would be extremely generous to borrowers, requiring only nominal payments from most students. It would turn every policy lever to the most generous setting on record, e.g., lowering the percentage of income owed from 10% to 25% under existing plans to 5%, lowering the number of years of payment required from 20 or 25 years to 10 years, and increasing income exemption from 150% to 225% of the poverty line. The median borrower who earns an associate degree would owe only $15 a month, regardless of how much he or she had borrowed. 
the median bachelor's degree borrower would owe only $68 a month. This plan essentially converts these student loans into delayed grant programs. End hour 11. Start hour 12. Page 370. Other